What's cracking, big dogs? Sorry, someone said that they really liked how I introed one of the previous videos, and I've been taking singing lessons, and apparently they're starting to pay off. Also, I'm standing for this video. I work at a standing desk, and I don't use it that often, but I felt like dancing a little bit, and we're gonna do this video standing. Plus, I get to talk about Leonard Fournette today, which always gets me riled up, and I need plenty of room to fucking flail my arms and stuff. Today, we're diving back into my running back rankings. Last week, we did rankings one through six, and then seven through 12, and those videos were doing well. Y'all really liked them. A lot of engagement, a lot of views, a lot of comments and whatnot. Good discussion in the comments section. So I figured, you know what? Let's just run this through the top 24 and do my RB1s, my RB2s, and we'll be set for the off season. Because these beginning videos are really where I start to get a clear picture of you know what happened in 2019 and what we could take away from all the numbers that we find in 2020 so these videos are where i find all the big facts and form formulate morph my opinion for pretty much the remainder of the offseason on these guys and then depending on the news that we hear throughout the summer things will change a little bit at a time as i started diving into rankings 13 14 15 i realized there was a lot of work to do because austin eckler aaron jones did not make the first 12 guys and i know i had a lot of explaining to do because y'all really like those guys so i started doing my research and the more I did the more numbers that started coming out before I know it the blog post is like fucking 32,000 words long and I realized I'm just gonna have to make this one video so today we're literally talking about rankings 13 14 and 15 if y'all enjoy the video click the button that looks like this underneath it subscribe to the channel if you're new for all fantasy football content the last thing you do tuck your shirt in stop yelling let's eat And as always, I want to show some love to those podcast listeners that only like to kick the flavor in the ear. This is from Mizo underscore Mars, the king. These podcasts are easily the best fantasy football analysis you are ever going to get. Unlike everyone else, Nick is always going to make sure that we as listeners are up to date on absolutely everything fantasy football and have that edge over other fantasy players. But that's not the only reason I love this podcast. Nick and BDGE as a whole are entertainers. So if you're looking for a show, something to occupy you, the best fantasy football analysis or a quick laugh, this is the place so as nick always says stop yelling and tuck your shirts in as y'all already heard me say so thank you uh miso underscore mars for the review i really appreciate that if you want a chance to have your review read make sure you head over to itunes and leave a five star rating and review as he said we're always trying to build a community over here i love you guys for all the support any of the engagement that we get in the off season throughout the summer during the season man this is why i do this i want to bring you guys together and just talk that talk so let's talk about something that's relevant and that is my man austin eckler austin eckler is my running back 13 his current adp is 205 off the board so about mid second round and he is the rb12 i'm also gonna preface by saying i'm really sorry for moving around a lot it's just i guess my new jersey nature the arms are always gonna flail i'm gonna move around a lot the hips don't fucking lie neither do austin eckler's numbers last year stat line 132 carries 557 yards on the ground three rushing scores through the air oh just a thing of beauty 108 targets 92 receptions 993 yards and eight touchdowns now i ain't gonna say i called this shit but the receiving numbers in the in the Chargers backfield were always like very 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 evident whoever was back there whoever was operating as the receiving back even when it was two guys they were going to get a lot of work and when Eckler became the guy we knew he was going to thrive in the passing game however for 2020 there is a lot of moving parts when we talk about Austin Eckler and what we expect to happen in this Chargers backfield four things that I think are really key that we're going to break down in depth we have Melvin Gordon moving over to Denver Broncos obviously Eckler secures the extra medium size bag and getting an extension from the Chargers a new quarterback under center no longer is it Phillip Rivers we have either Tyrod Taylor or Justin Herbert depending on whoever gets the starting job then we have Joshua Kelly a dynasty community staple as of right now fourth round running back out of UCLA what impact does that make on Eckler's outlook so we'll start with the first of four we'll start with Melvin Gordon obviously he held out the first four weeks of the season I don't think we'll ever get the type of usage that we got out of Eckler during those first four weeks where it was like you know it was like uh, when Alvin Kamara got the first three or four weeks when Mark Ingram was out a couple of years ago and it was just like elite 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 levels of fantasy usage and production that's kind of what we got out of Eckler from the first four weeks of the season let's go back though and look at what happened once Melvin Gordon actually got onto the field so from weeks five through the rest of the season Eckler was still the RB eight and a half PPR so while he was elite for the first month of the season he was still top eight over the last 12 weeks so we break down the numbers they were basically splitting time almost 50 50 obviously some of the plays they were both on the field for all of the passing work went in Eckler's favor all of the rushing work went in Melvin Gordon's favor pretty simple assessment there now Gordon leaving opens up 
a lot of touches, right? 204 touches to be exact. But most importantly, it opens up 15 goal line carries. This guy got 15 goal line carries, which was tied for third most in the NFL last year in 12 games. Now, one of the crazier stats that I found while researching this stuff is that while Eckler, you know, he started off on that elite pace. He scored three rushing touchdowns in the first four games when Gordon was out. Over the next 12 weeks, he scores zero rushing touchdowns touchdowns and we'll come bike to this part number two Eckler gets his extension right it's four years 24 and a half million dollars 15 million guaranteed so congrats to the god on that nothing really to dive into here other than that secures him being a very big piece of this offense as a weapon for the next two probably three years and during that time he's going to be operating with the new quarterback now I assume it's going to be Tyrod for at least the first half of the season I don't think Justin Herbert is going to come in there win the job as a rookie especially with not having the training camp you know not having the physical practices at least at this point it's hard to expect that to to actually take place at normal times maybe they get like a late training camp in where they have august or something like that but i doubt that gives him enough time to overtake tyrod who's obviously a veteran and has worked in many different offensive schemes so he'll come in and be able to play right away where herbert is i think at least going to sit for the first half of the season in my opinion this is bad news for austin eckler but probably not as bad as most people are making it out to be right the same narrative i spoke about with saquon barkley in my rb rankings videos one through six is the same point that I'll make here. When you have a mobile quarterback under center, yes, I know Christian McCaffrey caught a, a thousand balls with Cam Newton there, but for the most part, the very, very, very large majority of mobile quarterbacks bring the ceiling down from a receiving standpoint for the pass catching running backs. It's natural. They're athletes. Their first instinct when under pressure is to run, is to scramble, is to scoot right up the middle rather than looking around for their second, third read as the dump offs come. When you look at Rivers, like he might as well have been paralyzed from the waist down when you talk about how much he ran. So while this is going to hurt X volume in the passing game for sure right 108 targets I highly doubt he catches 92 passes next year but you got to understand like they signed Eckler to be a weapon he's not just simply a running back who catches dump off passes and stuff they have tons of design plays for him like that wheel route he runs last year where he scored multiple touchdowns on it's fucking more deadly than corona at this point and the big takeaway here the big the big number the big fact to take away here is once Gordon returned to the lineup Eckler ran his snaps out wide or from the slot on 33 percent of them so he was one third of his plays came from in the slot or out wide so he was almost operating as a wide receiver on a third of his plays that's a very significant number for a running back so while it's going to be a slight hit to the receiving numbers in terms of volume it's not like Eckler is, is like Leonard Fournette who literally finished last year with an average depth of target of 0.11 yards everything was a dump off so for Eckler he's a receiver as well so I don't expect the Chargers to be a good team right I think their win total is maybe at seven or seven and a half right now this lends itself to a lot of passing situations which is going to be good for Eckler of course now they drafted Josh Kelly in the fourth round and I'm by no means like one of the people that's high on Josh Kelly in the fantasy industry I think he's a little bit more than just the guy right I've comped him to Mike Davis before who is a very usable NFL back operate on all three downs if needed to he doesn't really do anything great though and the other thing to note here is that Justin Jackson was hurt for the majority of the 2019 season. So I don't think any of these guys is coming in and taking over the Melvin Gordon role, even though Joshua Kelly is obviously a big weight advantage guy over the other two backs, right? He's a lot heavier. So you kind of just expect him to take the Melvin Gordon role. I don't think either of these guys are going to come in and command 15 touches. They paid Eckler to be the guy. Does that mean he's going to be the featured back? No, no one's saying Eckler is going to get 20, 22, 25 touches a game. His receptions, his targets are going to go down, but the floor is still so high in that category because because they use that as part of their game plan. It's the same thing with Alvin Kamara, man. The reason that Alvin Kamara catches so many passes, they have that game plan into it, right? They want to keep Drew Brees with the ball in his hands for as little as possible. They don't want him to take hits. They have short dump offs. They have screens. They have Alvin Kamara running out wide or from the slot on a lot of his place. I think that Eckler's carry totals are probably going to go up. He had 132 last year, which is abysmal. I think you'll see that go up a little bit. So that will account for some of the volume he loses in the passing game, which are obviously a lot more valuable. But I think you'll see carry totals probably in like the 160 to, to 170 range and getting like 15 to 18 touches a game with four or five of them, four or five of those touches coming through the air, which is what makes him so, so valuable and could absolutely continue to keep him in that RB1 category. Again, I don't think he'll ever be like the top three or top five guy we saw from the first month. I would be hard pressed to say that he's like a top six to eight guy either but I think back end RB1 is probably where Eckler fits I also think his rushing efficiency will continue to be very high because as always when you have that mobile quarterback it freezes linebackers and opens up more holes 
in the secondary. The biggest question mark, as we touched on a little bit earlier with Gordon getting 15 goal line carries is who does see that work? Now, between Gordon and Eckler, them two saw 24 goal line carries together. That is a huge number. Now, Justin Jackson didn't get a single one last year, which tells me that they, you know, that he's not part of their game plan when it comes down to the goal line. He's clearly not the guy down there. So even if Eckler and Josh Kelly split those, right, say there's 20 carries and 10 of them go to Eckler, 10 of them go to Josh Kelly, Eckler can easily turn those 10 goal line carries into like four or five rushing scores, which makes me a little bit excited. So I think that's going to be probably a 50-50 split down there. Eckler's career high in rushing touchdowns is three. I think he easily surpasses that. So even if the efficiency and the volume come down in the passing game, he is still, still very, very, very likely to finish in that RB10 to 15 range. And you'd be happy to, to grab him here in any sort of PPR league. So Eckler, RB13. Aaron Jones, RB14, currently going off the board at the 206. So one pick behind Austin Eckler, one running back RB13 behind Austin Eckler. Aaron Jones is a, another really, 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 really interesting fantasy back this year because he's coming off this ridiculous touchdown year, right? 16 rushing touchdowns, another three through the air. And most people simply say, well, his touchdowns are going to regress, which is the worst piece of fucking analysis that you're going to hear all offseason. Because what happens if he regresses from 16 down to 15 rushing touchdowns? Yes, you are right, but that don't fucking help anybody because he's still going to be a top by fantasy running back. The big thing we need to look at and consider with a guy like Aaron Jones, well, there's there's multiple things, but here's the first thing. This split with Devontae Adams playing and Devontae Adams not playing. So this is a... Uh, this is a scary split. As the kids would call it, this is a this is a yikes moment. You see that Aaron Jones's numbers are massive with Devontae Adams out, and they take a big hit in the receiving game when Devontae Adams is on the field. And there's a reason, obviously, because Devontae Adams is an elite target commander. Only Michael Thomas had a higher target share on his respective team than Devontae Adams did in 2019. 30% of the targets went to Devontae Adams. So when Adams is gone, the targets obviously have to go somewhere. And the receiving games became ridiculous for Aaron Jones when Adams was out. So when you're looking at those four games and you're expecting Devontae Adams to play 15 or 16 next year, those are an extra 12 or 15 receptions on the bottom line for Jones, an extra 150 receiving yards, and probably a touchdown or two onto his receiving pace, which is something that you cannot bank on going into the future. Now, the rushing touchdowns, obviously, we need to aggress. He had 16 of them. Not going to happen again this year. Does that mean he's not going to score 10 to 12 rushing touchdowns? No, that's not what that means because Aaron Jones has been the single most most efficient running back inside the 10 yard line on the goal line since he has entered the NFL. You want to talk about regression. His efficiency is not regressing because he's just fucking good down there. Listen to this stat. Since he came into the league, he's had 31 rush attempts inside the 10 yard line. He has turned 19 of them into touchdowns. That is, that is a ridiculous ridiculously high rate. That's 61.3% of the carries inside the 10 yard line. He has turned into touchdowns. Most guys struggle to turn goal line carries at a higher than 50% rate. He's turning 10 yard runs, anything inside the 10 yard line at a 61.3% rate into a touchdown. That is uh, that is so underrated with Jones. I also like the fact that this is Matt LaFleur's second year in the offense. As we know, most offenses with a new scheme take a jump into the second year. I mean, for as much shit as we give Matt LaFleur and this just Packers offense as a whole, they went 13-3 and three in their first season under LaFleur. So the team's going to be good again, and they're going to get plenty of goal line opportunities. The question becomes, what happens with A.J. Dillon? They inexcusably drafted A.J. Dillon in the second round, and it's, it's almost solely... I want to do a lot of research on this and figure out what role they had in mind for A.J. Dillon. Like, why they decided to take him so early and what role they have you know envisioned for him in, in just 2020 so their their northeast regional scout this guy mike owens i believe had aj Dillon on his draft board since his freshman year so he found him and you know you get nostalgic with with something this is like think about like a fantasy player and i feel like i might have this with like terry mclaurin to be honest with you i might it might be a blind spot for me but he was my like favorite 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 waiver wire pickup after week one last year and he blew up afterwards and for that i'm like always going to be really really faithful to him even if you know there are a lot of red flags with a guy like terry you form these loyalties in fantasy football and probably as a scout as well you find a guy really on in their career and they prove you right so you want to show loyalty back to them and I think this was the case with Owens and AJ Dillon he was someone who scouted him during his freshman year absolutely loved him and this is why I think they pulled the trigger on him early in the second round now they're talking about him being like the thunder to Aaron Jones's lightning but Jamal Williams isn't going anywhere he's one of the best pass blocking backs actually in the, the NFL right now so I think you're going to see a timeshare behind Aaron Jones for that RB2 role and I think this this just makes the situation altogether more messy. What the Dylan pick really signals is that one, if not both of these Green Bay Packers running backs are probably going to be gone after 2020 because both of their contracts expire after this year. So Dylan would work his way into the 1A role to whoever else they have behind him. You hear a lot of these size speed comparisons like Derrick Henry when it comes to AJ Dylan. 
makes a little bit of sense because Matt LaFleur was the Titans coach prior to this or offensive coordinator and he coached Derrick Henry horribly but he still coached him so there might be a little bit of a comparison there and they didn't draft a single fucking wide receiver somehow so it tells you that this offense again is going to be run first run first run first but what, overall what makes you nervous about Aaron Jones is there's going to be a committee there right Jones barely saw 60 percent of the team snaps last year there were legitimately weeks of the season where there were Jamal Williams games think about that there were games you called this the Jamal Williams weeks that that phrase should never be a part of a team's offensive scheme there should never be a point where this week is the Jamal Williams week especially not while you have an Aaron Jones in the backfield so the fact that there were those weeks the fact that Aaron's only played on 60 percent of the snaps and now you add a big bruising guy like AJ Dillon in the second round tells me that Aaron Jones yes will have his week he'll probably be just as boom or bust as he was last year but probably a lot more inconsistent so that's why I'm not going to be drafting Aaron Jones as an RB1 this year if he in the second round I won't be pulling the trigger I'd feel okay about him in the third round probably about where you had to draft him last year so Aaron Jones my RB14 okay enough Austin Eckler enough Aaron Jones talk it's officially time to talk some shit about Uncle Lenny Leonard Fournette the RB15 going into this year he might be the RB15 he might be in my top 15 RBs but I cannot emphasize enough how big of a tear drop off there is between Aaron Jones and every other running back in fantasy like I barely feel comfortable drafting Aaron Jones in the third round so anyone that comes off after him is for me like a back end fourth early fifth round pick I'm serious anyone that was not named prior to Aaron Jones in the rankings videos thus far I won't be touching in the third round I know we've dove deep hopefully it's been a good video so far if you've enjoyed obviously hit the thumbs up if you're on podcast a rating and review would be beautiful but I want to take a second just sit right there and let me tell you about our draft guide extraordinaire so we put together a, a draft guide every summer we put out a lot of fucking content throughout the summer and the spring and whatever preparing you guys for your dynasty drafts your rookie drafts and your season-long drafts not all y'all i mean probably none of you can watch every single video that we put out shout out leave a comment if you do actually watch every video because that'd be fucking impressive i can barely get through editing one video of my own listening to my voice so if you actually watch every video i love you for that support what we do is we take the best shit that we do all summer the best information, the best big facts, the stats, and we compile it all together for y'all in a very organized, neat fashion in our draft guide. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. There's two. There's the Rookie and Dynasty, and then there's the Season Long, which preps you for your redraft league. So if you're getting into Dynasty, this will help you out, especially the newcomers. If you just do Season Long, there's also a guide for you. You can get both of them together for literally $10, though, because the draft guide is sponsored by Monkey Knife Fight. I love y'all, Monkey Knife Fight. BigDogsDraftGuide.com slash MKF. Within the guide, you're going to get all of my rankings. Dynasty, rookie, season-long, PPR, half PPR, standard, top sleepers, the top bust, ton of exclusive videos, mock drafts, tons of exclusive articles, the Bible, which is literally a round-by-round -round breakdown of guys that you should be targeting, the must-draft players within each round. There's just a shit ton of value within this draft guide. It's all of our best work organized into a little private website for y'all it's like a little private island it's the fiji of fantasy football bigdogsdraftguide.com you can cop for pre-order price right now if you are in states that are eligible for gambling bigdogsdraftguide.com slash mkf when you sign up with promo code bdge and you play a game on their site you will get access to both guides literally for ten dollars plus you get to play with the ten dollars on their site bigdogsdraftguide.com forward slash mkf i really gotta i might put like weights on the end of my wrists so that well one either i'll have really really good fucking muscles by the end of the summer or i'll learn to put my my hands down and stop yelling at y'all all right i guess it's time to talk about uncle lenny leonard fournette currently the 304 rb 16 in fantasy drafts i don't even want to think about the guy who went earlier than him it's todd Gurley sitting at the 15 and that just makes me want to throw up fournette I, I could probably just sit up here or stand up here and talk to you guys for the next 22 hours saying nothing besides 100 targets 100 targets 100 targets 100 targets 100 that that literally sums up Leonard Fournette's 2019 season in reality though if, if we wanted to sum up his season in a tweet this would be it arguably the best tweet of 2020 <laughs> Leonard Fournette busts open a 69 yard run against Tennessee finishes the game with 66 yards you love to see it you, you really love to see it so Leonard Fournette's 2019 season was the true true definition of the most overused phrase in fantasy football and it's that volume is 
king. Here's what most people don't understand. Volume is king for the perfect storm season. For one year, after the volume is king narrative gets washed up and they're inefficient running backs, that no longer plays. That kind of stuff always plays itself out over the long run. You don't keep feeding a guy who's wildly inefficient in your offense 300 touches over the course of multiple years. You do that one year, you learn your lesson as an offensive coordinator or a head coach, and you don't repeat that process. We look back at Leonard Fournette's season last year, and everyone just keeps talking about how his touchdown regression, he's going to score more touchdowns this year. And I said, Leonard Fournette wasn't bad last year because of touchdown inefficiencies or unlucky touchdown rate. Leonard Fournette was bad last year because Leonard Fournette was bad last year. And Jacksonville shoved the ball into his stomach over and over and over and over again. That does not make him good. It made him good for fantasy for one year. It makes the Jaguars a bad team. And that's what makes the team six and 10. If you look at the things he ranked outside of the top 20 at running back, Yards per touch, 27th. Yards per target, 41st. Yards per carry, 20th. Breakaway run percentage, 23rd. Evaded tackle percentage, 46th. So I pushed that narrative that it plays itself out over the long run. I could have just left y'all out to rot with no big facts to solidify what I'm talking about. But fuck that. We ain't these bullshit other fantasy football creators. This is big facts gotta eat. Definitely completely missed the sign there so here's what i did and follow along with me here i'm gonna take you down narrative street i'm gonna take you down the big fact boulevard right now i wanted to look at running backs who had really high volume seasons and low efficiency seasons and see what happened the next year right because coaches adapt you don't keep feeding an inefficient player so many touches so we use rotoviz's screener which is an amazing tool so follow along with me here i'm gonna break down the criteria i went back and looked at all of the running back seasons over the last 20 years so dating back to 2000 and then i looked at running backs that had 300 touches in a season so we're talking about over the last 20 years recent running backs who had very high workload volumes so that narrowed it down to about 200 to 250 running backs now i wanted to find running backs that had the high volume with low efficiency seasons and see what happened the following year right just like leonard fournette so obviously the efficiency numbers are a little difficult to find but what i used from rotoviz was their fantasy points over expect expectation number it's the best that i could really do here so it tells you basically how good they were in terms of how good they were expected to be given you know the carries and the targets they got in given situations and things like that compared to other running backs in similar situations and the average of what would have happened etc 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 so leonard fournette's uh, fantasy points over expectations last year were, were, were really, really bad. They were like bottom 20 over the last 20 years of guys who have gotten 300 touches. So I looked at these guys who had a ton of touches, over 300 touches, but were negative in terms of fantasy points over expectation. And this is what we found for that specific running back that met the criteria the following year. Everything about their volume, their touches, their efficiency, most importantly, their fantasy points suffered. They saw about 74 less rush attempts the next year. 14 fewer targets, 11 and a half fewer receptions, almost 300 total yards fewer the following season, minus 84 in the touch count, and most importantly, negative 44 on average, less fantasy points the following season. Now, rather than doing all that, I could have just saved us a bunch of time and told you that Jay Gruden is now the new offensive coordinator in Jacksonville, and he signed what is ultimately the death blow to Leonard Fournette's chance of being an RB1 in 2020 in the form of Chris Thompson. Thompson and Gruden, obviously very close from their time in Washington, and with Fournette set up to take all those one-yard runs straight up the middle and just run into the back of his linemen, that brings down Chris Thompson's probability of, of getting hurt from like 150% down to about 120%. They should literally give this dude zero carries this year and only use him in the passing game the key point here is Fournette is getting nowhere close to 100 targets he finished as like the rb 14 last year with 100 targets 76 receptions understand how hard it how bad you need to be how inefficient you need to be in order to finish that low with that type of volume dude they were trying to trade leonard fournette for like a sixth round pick they don't want him they tried to get rid of him and no one would take him that should also tell you something about how leonard fournette is viewed and how his own franchise views him so that 100 target number from 2019 is gonna get chopped down to like even if he's still even 60 targets is very high for running back i don't even expect him to be that high i, I would say he's going to be in between like the 50 
ish target range somewhere in there LaVisca Chanel is an absolute playmaker he's going to take a lot of plays by the line of scrimmage DJ Chark is the possession guy LaVisca Chanel is a playmaker around the line of scrimmage as well as a deep guy but for the most part he's going to see a lot of the targets that maybe Leonard Fournette saw as dump offs Chris Thompson coming in obviously kills Fournette's workload in the passing game so yes Leonard Fournette is due for positive regression I guess their offensive line sucks there's a reason he wasn't getting into the end zone he's not elusive down there his offensive line sucks I don't know why you would expect him to be so much better this year the way I'm looking at it is he's probably going to end up with somewhere from 1100 to 1200 yards of scrimmage total and yes positive regression in the touchdown total so maybe like seven to eight touchdowns this year but those numbers are not worth third round fantasy draft capital you can get very similar production from guys like Le'Veon Bell David Montgomery I know y'all want me to say David Johnson but I won't fucking do it two to three rounds later than you're getting Fournette right now taking Leonard Fournette in the third round legit makes me want to puke like like a fucking margarita that's made with orange juice point being Again, there's a monster tier gap, in my opinion, after Aaron Jones at the RB14 to whoever you have at the 15. For me, it's Leonard Fournette, but as you could tell by the way I'm talking about him, I absolutely hate him in the third round this year in redraft. Get your running backs early. That is the ultimate point, and that is also the final point here. I would like to leave you with a few things, though. If you guys are interested in getting the full top 20 rankings, which I will release a video for next week or probably on Thursday if this is coming out on Tuesday, that will be linked down below. You can literally take a link over to the rankings page sign up via email you'll also get our new newsletter which i'm really really excited the first one went out yesterday if you got it make sure you uh, reply to it and let us know what you thought about it it's a new project that we have over at big dogs basically keeping y'all up to date with everything in our newsletter what's going on with the brand things that we see on twitter um things that a lot of value for y'all so if you want the top 20 rankings that will be linked in the description which will also sign you up for the newsletter Go check out the draft guide, bigdogdraftguide.com. If you thought the big facts that were dropped in here were good, you are going to be blown away by the draft guide. I promise you that. Getting ready for your rookie drafts, your dynasty drafts, your season-long drafts. It's all fucking in there. You don't need to go anywhere else for fantasy football analysis this offseason. I promise you, Big Dogs has got you covered. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you want more bullshit like this in your life. Stay safe out there. Time to untuck the shirts.